Kia ora koutou, uh, Nisan Bolivnaka and uh, Marlo Ni. Uh, welcome everyone who's joining us in our Zoom uh, chat and also here on Facebook Live. Welcome to another Digital Pacific Live session. Uh, my name is Tim Kong and I'm the Program Manager of the Pacific Virtual Museum Pilot. Uh, and today my role is really just the technical host. Uh, but I'd just like to welcome you on behalf of uh, our Digital Pacific team. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to my colleague uh, Tapatu, who will uh, take over emceeing and being the host of this session. Thanks, Tapatu. Uh, Maloni, everybody. Um, thank you for joining in to our Zoom and also on Facebook Live um, to celebrate Tokulon Language Week here in Aotearoa. Um, today, we're very privileged to have Christy Knight from Archives New Zealand, who will be giving probably the first digital the first virtual tour of archives, um, but we're also going to be seeing a selection of Tokoloan items that they have um, at Archives New Zealand. So very privileged to see um, some of the items that they have. Um, first of all, we're going to do quick introductions. So, Faka Malo Atu Kia Te Koto Uma Ko Tapatu Kura Toku Ingoa. Um, my name is Tapatu Kura Ra'ia and I am the engagement manager for the Digital Pacific website. And so my role is to find uh, Pacific collections that are held in libraries, archives, museums and galleries around the world and get them to share it on our website, which is Digital Pacific. Um, I'll pass it over to Chrissy to quickly introduce herself and then we'll go on to the agenda for today. Whakatā loa, atu kia te ki te koutou, ko Chrissy Toko Ingoa. So, um, lovely to see you all this morning, virtually. Um, I'm an archivist on the digitisation programme here at Archives New Zealand. Thanks, Tafatū. Thanks, Chrissy. Um, so, the agenda for our session today, um, Chrissy will be sharing a virtual tour of the DigiLab um, at Archives New Zealand, located in Wellington. Um, she's also going to be showing a selection of Tokoan items that they have in their collection. Um, after that, I'll be sharing some of the Tokoan items that you can find on Digital Pacific website, but also on some other, some other platforms as well. Um, so please, if you have any questions, please put it in the Q&A chat or in the chat on Zoom. Um, if you've got questions on Facebook as well, we'll also relay them to either myself or Chrissy. So we'll try our best to answer the questions um, that come through. Um, so Chrissy, would you like to start our session off? I would. So we're in the repository at the moment, but where we really want to go, I want to bring you into our digitization lab, Kimaya Tanga. So follow me. We're coming into our new digi lab space. And we're going to take a little journey like the archives do through the lab. So as the archives come in from the repository, they come into the shelving here and you can see some of the different sizes, huge books, lots of files, smaller books, various things, all kinds of different formats. And a lot of, most of our stuff of course comes in in a nice acid-free box because we're trying to look after everything. Um, as we do a bit of a sweep through the lab, you'll see, so it's a lovely new big space and you'll see we've got a real suite of state-of-the-art equipment and we've got a few reasons for that. Um, firstly, because archives are unique and precious, we need to make a good job of looking after them. And uh, because as I've said, archives come in all shapes and sizes from those really big books that I showed you to huge maps, we need a few different kind of ways of photographing them. So um, that's why we've got the different stations and that's what I'm going to show you. <clears throat> and digitization itself can be a bit of a rigorous process. So that's why we have different um, options for how we photograph and record the, the archives as well. It depends on the state the archive's in and what kind of archive it is too. Um, it might not be able to stand up going through the scanner. So then we might need to photograph it from overhead. So we'll show you that as we go down through the lab. Um, but firstly, the archives, yes, I said they come into the shelves and then they land on here, which is our prep table, which is where we 
page by page go through and take out every every pin or um, paper clip, um, unfold the corners carefully with, with um, our little tools to prepare each page for the scanning machine because we need to get as good a copy as we can. We don't want to do this job twice. We want to get a good, good result first time. So most of our files are loose pages. And so once we've got the pin out, they can come onto here, which probably machines that you're quite um, familiar with, a flatbed scanner. So these are a sophisticated version, but that's where most of our capture is done on these stations. And we can see my colleague Joel here is working his way through a file. Hmm. How many stages are there in this digitization? In the process, process. we've got nine yeah. stages. So this is about stage three is oh. capture. Um, and one just point to note, while he's got this image up on the screen still, you can see the black margin around the edge of it. We've done that on purpose because we want to make it really clear to people that that's the edge of the page. There's nothing hidden. We haven't got anything folded around that they can't see because it's, it's really um, key to us that we make sure that we provide an accurate record of these government documents for the public to be able to see. So that's one of the ways that we make sure that that's really clear visually for people. So coming on through, if, if a file had some bigger stuff in it, sometimes that happens, you might have a map or something folded inside the file. And as you're working through it, it the, the map's going to be too big to fit onto the flatbed scanner. Then we might have to come down onto the SMA. So here's another colleague of mine, Tom, through a really big book at the moment. So... This is a, um, a marvellous piece of equipment. It's very sophisticated. It lifts and lowers. You could see it just lifting there. It, oh, here it comes. It's taking the image now. Whoa. Yeah. Scan it drops down. So it's all looking after the archives as well as we can. They're, they're on these cushions here to keep it up against the glass. And then Tom, if he's happy with that page, the, the, the view that he's got, then he'll turn the page and do the next one. So although digitization is really high tech, it's also got a lot of digits involved as well. There's a lot of handwork in going page by page to capture everything. So thank you, Tom. Um, and we'll do a quick sort of sweep. You can see our, we've got three different studio spaces set up plus a transmissive capture in the corner. So a couple of my colleagues are working away right here. In the, in the corner, Hamish is working on a machine fairly similar to what Tom is using. It's a, it's a book cradle, which again, um, the book cradle has pads like this to be able to um, adjust the depth of the book and you're working through it. So it keeps it up against the glass. So that's what happens over there on the book cradle. And Ish, we'll have a little sweep in here. This is where we do special stuff, which isn't gonna fit on the other machines. I'll let um, the camera go in ahead of me. Um, is there a map of the South Island? Yeah, here's a map of the South Island, but you may not know, the South Island originally was called Middle Island by the early settlers. Um, so that's part of the evidence that's on that map. And now what, what we have here is the camera is up here, so it's doing a non-contact capture. You see the other stations that we looked at, the flatbed, we're putting it down onto the screen, um, and the SMA, we're lifting it up to the glass. But this one is, is no touch. So um, if we, we might have stuff that's a bit more three-dimensional or got a wax seal, that sort of thing on, on the archive, then we may need to employ this method. Ooh. So coming back, we're going to sweep back through the lab and I'm going to, yeah, start introducing you to some of the popular archives that I have. Ooh. Unless there were any other questions. That was sweep. Mm -hmm. Oh, we just got a um, comment from Dan. A big LCD for assessing scans is going on the Christmas wish list <laughs> from um, Auckland Libraries. Loving the talk, Chrissy, and Digital Pacific. 
I can tell this is going to be a popular webinar. Awesome. Oh, that's very encouraging. Thank you, guys. <laughs> um, right, so coming, just finishing off the, the process that I've shown you. So we've come in from the stacks. You saw the, the archives waiting on the shelves. They go into the prep table where they're prepared page by page. Then they get captured. And then after that, they go into a quality control stage. And our cardinal rule is you don't check your own work. If you've captured a file, then it needs to be someone else who does the quality check. Um, and then after QC, um, then we ingest the material into our digital repository so that people can find it. And then eventually the physical item gets repacked back into its its box, its folder, taken back into the stacks again where it rests. So we keep the physical as our preservation copy. We're not throwing them away. Um, so the digital copy that we've made is our access copy um, for you know the public, the people, the and government agencies, of course, to be able to view. But now I'm sure you're all looking out to see something from Kokolau. <laughs> um, I have found. I did a really quick survey. I just went Pokalau in the search box for titles and I found 1,300 items in the archive um, and only 200 of them were digitized. Now, so, you know, we've got over a thousand items still just sleeping quietly out there in the archive. Um, and the, the things that were digitized, most of them are photographs, but only three of them were sort of more substantial files about different things. Yeah. So this is where um, I'm so delighted to have this opportunity to kind of connect with you, um, is that I really would love to have some help in hearing from the community, from you, what's more important to you. Because mm -hmm. we've got this, you know, program of work. We're going to digitise everything, but it's going to take us a really long time. But if I can make some connections and, and hear from you guys what's, more of interest to you, then we can prioritize those items and get them up faster and get them into the Digital Pacific Museum as well, the online museum, so that you can see them. So, uh, I've got a question, Chrissy, oh, how many, oh no, this is just my question. Yes. How many people are in your team that are on this project? Well, uh, <laughs> depends on, on which day. People keep, um, you know, we keep growing and then losing some people. So at the moment, we're on around 15. Oh, uh, nice with some more about to start, perhaps even two more about to start, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So you've got a, a few more in your team that can help with this work as well. Yeah, yeah, um, but it's, as I said, it is such a big job um, that we're, we're looking to just grow the team. This, this is a big area. Um, there's a lot of work to do. Yeah. Awesome. Cool, okay. I'll let oh, you right. the, the Hi, let me introduce you, first of all, to um, this is a historic document so I'm going to line it up and let my cameraman here give you a bit of a close-up so this is an indenture from 1874 and not sure that you'll be able to read very much of it I'm going to flip the page so you can see it's that's the whole document <clears throat> and it is here we go. Sorry, I've got my pages around the wrong way. This is um, a record of the sales agreement between Siva and Paul, who are natives of Tokolau Islands, with this uh, gentleman called Antonio Pereira, who is from Cape Verde Islands, which I had to look that up on the map. You may know um, that's off the coast of Senegal in Africa. Wow. It was colonized by the Portuguese. So Antonio Pereira has come all the way from um, West Coast of Africa to Tokelau and has purchased um, regarding the sale of Nukumato and Fanuala, sorry about my pronunciation, um, these two islands. Mm -hmm. So that in itself, I mean, that was just quite remarkable to think of one person buying two islands from Siva and Paul. But as I looked further into the archives, I found this lovely connection to 1989. So we've gone, we're jumping from 1874 to 1989. <clears throat> In this archive, it is about, uh, here we go. I'll open it to the, the photographs because then you can get a, get a good look. So this archive is about traditional Pacific Island arts, a visual arts project. 
And so this is the Tokelauan Women Association called Koki. Koki. Now, so in 1989, they were running um, activity programs and they were applying for funding. So that's what the rest of this file is showing is the funding applications. And so in here is all the details about why they were doing it, what they need needed. They were um, importing materials from Tokelau because they couldn't get the stuff they needed in Porirua, the, um, you know, the pandanus. And as, yeah, oh, and it, it just it gives a lovely description here about their reasons for wanting to bring the older people and younger people together and share the traditional crafts. Um, and then to my amazement, I found Mrs. M. Pereira. Oh, committee. It was her and Mrs. Akutatala. So, I mean, I ask you, is she a descendant of Antonio? Quite probably. And here she is now in Cannons Creek in 1989, organizing and teaching, sharing, um, yeah, the, the knowledge from back home. So, I found that, sorry, but I found that pretty darn exciting. <laughs> So there were some more in that series. So there'd been three different um, groups that were running. Um, one in Petoni called Whatuaki uh, Whakatokalau. And there's some um, photographs for them as well. Here we go. So, and the other group was in, oh, they were called Mamas, and they were in Nainai. So that's just, that's what archives do. They give us a snapshot into a moment. So we can see what was happening in Wellington with the um, people who've been living in New Zealand for some time now, and we're wanting to make sure that the, the knowledge isn't lost from back home, keeping that connection to home. So that was those ones. Oh, we've got some comments. Oh, yes, I'll pause. Hi, Fully Pereira is our Pacific curator and the only Tokelon curator, curator in the world. Oh, wow. She might be a descendant as well. Awesome, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for that comment. Um, now, the next file I've got to show you is called it's about it's called coins it's just called tokelau coins so i thought well that sounds interesting what's that about and it's from 1979 uh, sorry so, let's get to the right page and then i'll get parents to come and do another zoom in can you manage that yeah nice thank you Oh. So here's a little leaflet describing the minting of this commemorative coin, the Tahitala, in 1978. And this little leaflet um, describes what was, you know, the process, what was happening, and it also gives the name of the artist I was pleased to see. Uh, so you, you saw one side there was Queen Elizabeth in profile, and then that's the, um, you know, the obvious, and then the, the front-facing side where it says Tahitala, um, the design is by Bara Moholo, the first Tokelauan artist to study in New Zealand. So apologies again for my pronunciation. But um, I was delighted to see that. We, we still have that. We have that noted as um, he was the original artist. And that's a name for me as an archivist. It's like, oh, that's a name that I could now search on as well. And we could see what else we might have that's um, hidden in the archives with him. So um, were, how were those coins produced? Yeah. Um, well, they were produced um, as a commemorative coin. So, you know, you buy it in a nice little velvet box. Um, I think they were legal tender as well. You could just use it, you know, and it was worth a tala. But um, they were, it was so successful, in fact. It, that's what this uh, newspaper article talks about. I'll just sort of hold that up. So I've got this newspaper article here showing the coin. And uh, this is saying that the one dollar coin, sorry, the, um, the 1978 mintage was so successful, there was an application to run it again in 1979. Oh, cool. So it, it did sort of um, generate some funds. You know, it was mm -hmm. just 
done as a commercial venture for the, you know, the Tokelau government, the community, the people. Um, and then, yeah, it was, it's so successful they had to run it again. But there's, I mean, I've just skimmed through the file. There's, there's all I these. Think, other I think when we and Pez um, came in, we saw that the coins were produced in Porirua too. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, there was like a little application form and it said um, produced in Purirua. So thank yep. you to the Tokolowans in Purirua for getting yep. that um, coin made. Right? <laughs> That's right. Yep. Cool. Okay. So the last thing that I had to show you. Sorry. Chrissy, yes. just um, well, we had one query in the chat, um, and I'll try and type it. Was the name of that artist? Could you please repeat the name of the artist, and I'll time type it into the chat. <laughs> okay. All right. So, F A R A I M O, and then P A U L O. Thanks, Chrissy. Choice. Thank you. Great. So yeah, let me know if any of you know him or something about him. Yeah, let me know. Now the last thing that I had found to show you this morning. Is. Um, I didn't get myself some white gloves and I'm feeling really uncomfortable about nearing, being near these photographs with my white gloves. So just, there's some. I've got one, so we'll go. For those, for those of you watching, that was very briefly the, the mysterious cameraman just to the right of the frame there, but Terence has returned behind the camera now. So you saw him very briefly. <laughs> and yeah, just to sort of, so you know, um, that's, that's how we we operate in here. We're we're always mindful of the archive. It's like once it's arrived here, it's not a working document in the same way that it was when it was out in the government agency and being used as a report or being written on or you know read and thumbed. So with photographs particularly, we do make sure that we don't leave any evidence of our viewing by our fingerprints on the photographs, and we you know we wear white gloves. So this is a uh, sort of lining it up. It's kind of funny because the two photographs are one, but it's cut in half. That's it, nice. Mm. These are some images of stamps from, oh, it says no date on it. And this is what happens in the archives as well, is that I can't tell. That's all I have. It's just no date. Um, post office history, Tokelau fishing stamps. So some... Uh, knowledge from from you from the community would be really helpful it's like i can see you know i can read those images visually like i can see you know on this one the the bait how it's tied on two fish onto the hook mm. fascinating and whatever this is here it's an octopus oh it's an octopus lure. Catch lure. yeah and this one it looks like it's just a Sort of a wow. net where you just perhaps scoop the fish out of the water, but yeah, it's um, quite interesting the amount those those numbers on the on the stamps. I mean, is, it the price? is it how much it would cost? Or are they it, oh, thank you, Top of Two. It says five s, eighteen s, so I must be shines. Otherwise, it would oh. be if it was cents. Yeah, so it must be. So that could actually be a little clue. So archives provide evidence for us, and sometimes it's a matter of being able to interpret the evidence. So that's a pointer that perhaps it's. Oh, um, Leonie just put through. It could be Sydney, which might be the. Oh, thank you. Oh, your currency. Yeah. Ah, yeah. No, that's more likely because of yeah. the. Just the vintage, the look of the photograph, the look of the images. I'd, I'd be surprised if it was way back before 19, whatever it is, 67, yeah. I think is when we went to do some currency. Yeah. So, yeah, that's probably, 
perhaps this was a version that was um, distributed in for Tokelau, and maybe they did another print run for New Zealand Mail that had cents on it. I don't know, it'd be interesting, but it'd be nice to, to know whether, I mean, I'm also, I look at this critically as well, and I go, I wonder how accurate that is to actually your traditional fishing methods. Is this really how you do it, or is it a bit staged? Has it been a bit kind of, I don't know, drawn up to, yeah, is it? Yeah, I don't know. I guess it, it just, it answers some questions, but it, it produces a lot of questions for me as well. And so, if you, you know, someone who, who knew about fishing would be able to help me interpret those images. So, yeah, to kind of, to, to wrap up, those were the things that I found for you. But as I said, there were, um, you know, 1,100 items that were not digitised mm -hmm. and I could have pulled out more. And it would be really, um, be really wonderful to hear from you, you people, what, what's more significant, because we've got, we've got topics like shipping, health, dental, education, aerodromes, island affairs, immigration, Tokelau English Dictionary, intelligence, population, exports, cyclones, rat control, regulations, births, deaths and marriages. So there's a huge kind of breadth of different topics, but... Um, yeah, some some kind of guidance would be really really nice. Um, so, yeah, I think um, so. Leona just asked: Is the the artist for the stamps known on the record? No, not known. She or, just yeah. That's that's all. <laughs> that's all you've got. Oops, there we go. That's all I've got, and no date. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I wrote that down the bottom there, whoop, saying 1983 maybe from the other ones, because it came out of a file, there were other ones beside it, and I thought, well, the other ones had some dates around mm -hmm. 83, 86. Yeah. Are these, so the piece of paper that you just held up, so mm -hmm. could you find that information on your website as well? Yes. Yes, all, all of that information will be, yeah, if you, if you found the item, if, you go, if you're going through Digital Pacific and our stuff is in the museum, then it will take you to our, our website and you'll see this information, yes. And mm -hmm. so it's not much there, it's because we haven't got much. Um, yeah, or we haven't had the time to go back and, and fill in all of the detail that we have got. Yeah. Okay. So this this tells you which government agency um, created the record. So in this case, it, it is New Zealand Post. Um, and yeah, and, and links it because archives are about relationships as well. They, items exist by themselves, but they exist in these relationships. So these, the stamps, you know, the, the things that I've shown you are from all kinds of different series, which were all about different things and created by different agencies. So thinking about Fokapap is quite helpful with, with when you're working with archives as well. It's like, what's it come from? What's it linked to? Cool. Yeah. Um, so do you, have you got recent, um, do you get new collections coming into you to digitize? And where do they come from? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, because we are an archive and we're, we're different to say a museum or maybe a, a collecting archive, we are the government record of New Zealand. And so we receive the archives from the government departments, um, but we have a, a time lag. So we're getting stuff 25 years after it's been created. Uh -huh. We're different to say like a museum or an art gallery who might go out and actually purchase things. They will go to auction and buy new things for their collections. So we receive what what we're given, or we, we have a hand in determining what comes to us because we don't take everything because it's far too much. So we work with the agency to decide what's the most significant from the record that they're going to archive with us. But it, it is um, a, yeah, a, a longer process um, because they're still using the records. If they're earlier, they're still using them in the office. And then after that 25 years, they can come to us here. So that's been the model for the physical records, which is what I've shown you this morning, physical analog records. But now we're moving to this digital environment where so many um, 
business documents and government records are made digitally, uh, the rules are changing. So some of those timelines are changing too. Wow, that's really interesting. I didn't know it. You get it like 25-year-old things. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah, that's how it is now. Yeah. Um, we've got a comment from Helen on Facebook. FYI, Auckland Uni hosts a digital copy of the 1986 dictionary available online. Not sure if that dictionary you mentioned is that version. Chrissy, interested to know the percentage of items being privately provided versus government departments. Useful to thinking about prioritization. Which, yeah, which the prioritization is. Um, open to getting people to come in and help with that prioritization as well yeah yeah um as a as a blanket kind of answer we don't receive items from people privately um, apart from ministers of parliament um, who may give their collection as they leave office and there may be some personal items in that that they've received while in office for instance you know they might go to a function and be given um, you know a medi or a, a ceremonial cup so that might come to us but um, yeah most of the records are coming from the business the working of government so the you know we're, eventually we're going to get all this COVID documentation about how New Zealand worked out how to deal with COVID and just all of the different steps and processes that were kind of developed through government that will come to us too. Mm, cool, yeah. thank you, Chrissy. Um, we've got another comment um, from Trisha on Facebook. Don't know if it's relevant, but I see the stamp, the same set of stamps on the trade me with the title Tokelau, <laughs> 82 fishing set. And so she's put the item number on it. So Brilliant. maybe you can find them on trade me. Yes, yes. Um, and we, we talked about that too. When Topi 2 came in for a little pre-visit before this, yeah. session, we talked about the coins and the stamps. And I thought, they're probably out there. Probably people have some of these. Maybe they have some of the stamps on an old envelope or, or maybe someone's got the, the coins tucked away in a drawer as well because these were widely distributed. So mm. what we've got in the record here is... It's the making of these things. Yeah. Yeah. I had a chat with Jocelyn, so she's from the Tokelon community, and she said that she also has the coin as well. Her right. family has one. Oh. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Cool. I think that's all the questions that have come through and comments. So I think I'll sh thank you, Chrissy, for showing that demonstration. If you guys do have any more questions for Chrissy, just put them in the chat and we can answer them as we go as well. But also thank you, Chrissy, for sharing all of those items. It's really interested, interesting to see the process, but also how it, how long it takes to digitize these items before we can see them online. Mm. That nine step process. Yeah. And that 25 year wait. <laughs> Awesome. So I'm just going to be um, giving a brief overview of Digital Pacific website um, and um, how you guys can contribute your knowledge to the website. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so this is the Digital Pacific website. Hopefully you guys can see that. Yeah. Um, so this is our website. So um, Digital Pacific's about P A S I F I K dot org, which is the top percent spelling for um, Pacific. Um, so, this is a project, a pilot project that's running for two years um, that me and Tim are working on called the Pacific Virtual Museum. Um, part of the project is this website and the aim of this website is to make accessible uh, Pacific collections that are held in museums, galleries, archives and libraries around the world and getting them, um, allowing Pacific people to see them. Uh, so this is actually funded by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade um, in Australia but implemented by the National Library of New Zealand and also the National Library of Australia. Um, so as you can see, there's a Tokelon greeting to celebrate um, Tokelon Language Week here in Aotearoa. We've also got a search bar. Um, and also, if you hover, you can also explore by locations. 
So if you hover over the location names, you can also see the beautiful outlines of our Pacific Islands. Um, so we wanted to make sure that this website was accessible for all Pacific people. So uh, when we designed it, we made sure that it was designed for mobile first and it also worked on low bandwidth. So it works on 2G and 3G networks, um, but also um, it won't show up all your data. We know that data is really expensive in the Pacific. So each of the pages are under a megabyte. Um, so we did user testing in the Pacific to make sure that our Pacific people were able to use it. Um, so we categorized heaps of the um, items by image, object, video, audio, text, and maps. But you can also uh, discover, um, look through with our content partners as well, which is going to take too long, so I'll go here. So at the moment, on our website, um, we have about 196 content partners from all around the world. So um, the largest collection that we have so far is the Trove Digital Library, um, which is a similar website to us, which is an aggregator. So it has items um, tag Pacific from many institutions in Australia. Um, we've got the Smithsonian Institution, which is in the US. Um, and so all of these content partners, the uh, US ones have just come in on Tuesday last week. So, which has made our digital catalog really big. Um, and so we've also got um, Pacific um, community groups and uh, that are also sharing their content on YouTube, like the Longa Nui. Um, so it's really easy for us to harvest um, content on YouTube. So if you know of any uh, community groups that are doing an um, awesome job at um, preserving the Pacific culture, let us know and then we can also make them a content partner. So the Deakin University, which is in Australia. So yeah, so you wouldn't think that the University of Illinois would have Pacific collections, um, but they, at the moment they have 21 items so far. New York, New York Public Library. Yeah, so what I'm going to show you is some collections from the Alexander Turnbull Library. So I'll click on that. Um, so the Alexander Turnbull Library is here, the, is in the National Library in Wellington. Um, each of our content partner um, has a profile page. So kind of gives you a little bit about the background of the organization, where they're located, but also a link to their website. So I, in the Alexander Turnbull Library content partner page, I've just searched Tokelau. And it comes up with some of these really cool images. So Tokelau and children singing at the Hours and Youth Camp in Purirua. And this was photographed by Ian McKinley, Lachlan Group who came to live in Wellington and a few other items as well. But I'm going to show, so once you click on the item, it takes you to another page, but it shows the description, the date, the piece and what collection it belongs to. So if you click on um, the image, it will take you to the original record here, which is from the National Library. So the top line, um, so yeah, if anybody was even at the, the event or know the people in the, the images, we want to hear from you. Um, later on, I'll be showing you how you can contribute your knowledge to these images. Um, and this item here, I think this is an awesome image, so I'll just um, go to the original. Look how warm they look. And so this image is a group of young men and women from the Tokelau Islands who came to live in Wellington from left to right. So it just has their names. And then so this photo was taken in 1964 um, and published in the Evening Post in
Oh yeah, awesome image as well. So many of the descendants may still be living in Wellington today. Um, the next image, uh, so if I go back. So now I'm on the, the Tokelon country page that I showed earlier. And so um, we have a uh, 1,032 records from Tokelo. Um, you can also search by media type so maps, images, objects, text, video and audio, and it tells you how many items there are. And also the content partners that have top of items. So Te Papa, National Library of Australia, Trove, Auckland War Memorial, the Smithsonian, Pokemon TV, ABC, Alexander Turnbull as well. And the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Um, so I wanted to highlight one of the items, uh, objects that the Smithsonian um, currently hold, which is this one here, the wooden rivets fish hook. And so it's um, from the Smithsonian too. Um, so if you, we've got a, once you go to the original um, record, you get this really beautiful image of the hook. Um, it shows the, how big it is, but it also has notes on the card as well. So collected before 1857, originally catalogued as from Tahiti, but according to Gudger, um, which was also, then he identified it as a Tokoloan hook. So it was really cool that they acknowledged that they had originally had it as a Tahitian hook, but then um, have changed it to Tokelau. Um, and then the next item I wanted to show is from Archives New Zealand. So um, one of the things that we're harvesting from Archives is their YouTube channel. And on their YouTube channel, they've got this amazing uh, video of the Atoll people in 1970. So if I clicked on that, it will take you to this individual page. So New Zealand's National Film Unit presents Atoll People 1970. This is a very human and moving story, probing the dilemma of the Tokelau Islanders, New Zealand. Citizens who make a bare living on their tiny coral islands, should they stay there? Should they make a new life in New Zealand or urban society? Um, and so if you click on this, um, Python, it will take you to their original, where we get the, um, the video from, which is from YouTube. So I'll quickly just play a little clip of it. So Copra was Just pause it there. So if you know anybody in these videos or your descendants from it, um, please let us know. I'll just show you how you can contribute as well. So on each of the items, we have this button at the bottom. Remember or recognize anyone about this item, let us know. So you can contribute your story here. So if you click on it, um, why share your story to, on the site? Sharing your thoughts, memories, and personal experiences or knowledge about this record helps to create a more interesting and powerful experience for, for users of the site. So let's get started. So I'll just quickly run you through the process of sharing your knowledge and your story. So share your story. Um, you can put your name here. Um, but there's also options to have your name um, shown publicly or not. So you could be shown as a guest. Um, the only information that we kind of need from you is your email. Um, um, and so this is in case archives would like to get in contact with you um, or else, yes, yeah, so or if we would like to get in contact with you to have, get further knowledge or further information about your story. Um, or else, but if you don't want 
any of the information to be shared or um, or us to contact you, you can also click this option. Um, also the place. So the place could be where the story is set, but also the place that you reside now. Um, your story title could be Hip Times, um, and then you would write your story. Um, there's no limit on how many characters at the moment. So yeah, you can just share um, anything. So this could be memories, um, experiences, or if you know the person. Um, then you would click next, which will take you to the review, and then a wee thank you from us. And so once you click next, um, it's then published on our website, on our user contributions area. So this is on our main page. So if you click here, it will take you to the other um, user contributions that have, we've got. Um, so I'm just gonna show you some of the examples. So at the moment, we've got 18 contributions shared. Um, like this one here was from Ruka. I used to go to this kindergarten by Lotoka Sugar Mill back in the 90s when the mill was in production. I remember a sweet smell coming from the mill. So it could be an experience, it could be a scent. Um, some of them are pretty short as well. Or, so this one is of Zayona Church in uh, Avaroa in Rarotonga. And then also you can you can um, also um, type it in your own language as well. We don't do any moderation on the site. Um, if we don't understand, we also have, um, if you click on the item, if people are saying anything offensive that we don't know about, um, we kind of crowdsourcing. Um, so you can click report this conference contribution and then we will contact the person that has wrote the story but at the moment everything everyone has been very respectful and using the feature how it's supposed to be used um, and this one here so um, someone has identified this lady here the mama in the pink is my auntie Tungane. I think the photo is taken just outside her house. Me and my family stayed at her home in Moke in 1989, just after Christmas. We spent over a week on Moke. I was brought up in Moke and left when I was 10. It was a trip of a lifetime to show my young family. So once you contribute um, your story, you'll also get two versions. So the version that um, Te Papa holds, which is this bit here, and the date, the location, but you also have a separate box for user contributions. Kind of just shows, um, you know, two different stories and it gives specific people a chance to share their experiences of their homeland. Cool, so that is the Digital Pacific um, user contributions. So if you have any questions, just give us an email. Um, you can find our email in the about page. Um, I also wanted to show some of the collections or digitized images that Chrissy was talking about from archives. Um, she sent through three images to me last week. So I just thought I'd like to share it today. Um, so this is the website Archway. So um, this is one of the images she sent. So the title is Tokla Islands, publicity caption, Father Peter Maunga, the parish priest of the Tokloans, with some of his parishioners. parishioners. The inside of the church is very simple and behind the altar hangs a finely woven mat. And so the photographer was Mr. Nicholson. I don't think there's a year on here, maybe it's somewhere else, but I think that's a really beautiful image of one of the churches in Tokola. I thought that was really cool. Um, and then so the second image that she showed me was this one here. Um, I think this was also taken by Mr. Nicholson. Um, a canoe is made from pieces of timber along the joins, holes and board and the pieces of the lash together. Not too sure what the year was as well for this one either. Chrissy, did you know? I think it was about 1966. Oh, 1966. I thought that was also a really cool 
image to show. Um, and the last image, which was used to advertise the Facebook and uh, event. Um, so this was also by Mr. Nicholson, the largest bell cast in New Zealand, which was bought by Tokoloans living here and sent to the Catholic Church in the Tokolos. On the left is Pastor Kio, a Samoan pastor. Um, so I actually got a comment from Ruth, who is the daughter-in-law of the pastor here. And so she actually um, sent us through some corrections um, for the item. And so I think in the description, we had actually spelt his name wrong and also got his title wrong. So we're going to work really hard to see if we can change it um, in the records as well. But it was really cool because she also sent um, some history of the family. And because without that, it's just this title that we've got to classify this image. But if I might actually ask her if she could make a user contribution as well. But yeah, um, just asking people to send us an email if we've got things wrong or if things need to be corrected. Um, it's really good to hear from the community and hear from the descendants of the people in the photographs. So yeah, that was really cool. And we're always open to showing the collections to the community as well. So if you are in Wellington, um, just send us an email and we'd love to get the collections out to show you as well. And so um, if you want to know more about um, the website, um, check our blog section, which is on our homepage as well. So if you click on here, um, we've got um, blogs written by some of our colleagues here at the National Library and outside of the National Library too, to celebrate language weeks. But we've also got some really good, um, good ones written by Tim to explain the process that uh, we're working on developing the website as well. So authority, yeah, so have a read of those. Um, and Taz Mingalo has also written a blog for Tokelo and Language Week, so that will be up tomorrow, so um, keep an eye on that. So the recording of the session will also go onto our YouTube channel, um, so you can also catch uh, some of the other videos that we've done to celebrate the Language Weeks as well and also talk to our uh, content partners. So yeah, hopefully that was very, I just got lots of information from that. <laughs> I, don't, I wasn't checking the, um, the questions or anything, but I think Tim's got his answer. There's one, uh, yeah, there's one here for you, Chrissy, from um, Tapa, uh, not from Tapatu, from mm -hmm. Leone, uh, which was in reference to the, um, uh, the information that came in via Facebook, that little uh, piece of information that Tapatu shared about the image of the pastor's daughter. Uh, and Leonie was interested in how uh, archives would capture that and then record it on, on the source. Uh, the, and it's not the analog source, the preservation source, it's the digital source, I guess. Yeah. Um, and, and what process that would be. And if one wondered if you could talk to that at all. Okay. Um... This is um, a space that we're really keen to sort of move more into. We don't have good systems set up for that yet, but um, we need to be gathering this information for when we are more able to sort of feed it straight through. So at the moment, yes, I can make an individual correction on an item and I will look into, into that, um, but we don't have the sort of same facility set up as Digital Pacific have of being able to tag and write stories against items. So what I'm going to do, I mean, this has been really great to see what these guys are doing. And at the moment, I just want to jump on their bandwagon and put our <laughs> photos at the museum so that you can see them there and you'll be able to add your stories there. So it's kind of, yeah, that's it's, it's a two-pronged thing. I will still see what I can do to correct things as they appear but we've got 200 photos that I could sort of push through to the museum and you know the online museum and then you guys will all just be able to go crazy and add all of your contributions that way yeah 
Lovely. Thank you, Chrissy. And and Suliana's actually also mentioned in the in the Q and A or the comments there around. Um, uh, and Soliana's at Alexander Turnbull Library and National Library. Um, obviously, each institution will have its own process <laughs> uh, of, of how, and, and also capacity in terms of staffing and um, acquisitions and descriptions and then feeding back. Um, and um, yeah, I think we've, and Tapatu's laid it out really well, the, what, what we're able to do. We've always seen ourselves as a team that serves as a bridge between the worlds, a uh, bridge between the worlds of archives. And as Chris has just said, you know, if, if our capacity that, contribute your story function can can be a way for um pacific island people to to put some of these stories in a way that's held not quite on the source but that's one way and then we also bring you closer to having a, a conversation with an institution around how it might be uh that that correction or that that additional information might be held on the source is also just as important so um yeah thank you thank you chrissy for that and like i said is quite different um or can be different <laughs> across all and i guess chrissy i was also just reflecting on your um what you'd said earlier on and i hadn't i knew it but i hadn't it, how you said it re re reinforced it that archives new zealand in its context is very much the holder of the public record and the government the government um documentation and the government things that come through and and i guess what um that's a really important role within um new zealand's democracy aotearoa's democracy but I think there's a fascinating piece where the records you hold, and I was thinking of that uh, that indentured one, or the, the um, you know, can now appear alongside records from other libraries and other institutions in in Digital Pacific, and that's quite a powerful narrative, and a very different way of seeing all of these records. Um, and and so yeah, just thankful for the work that you all do as an institution, and and grateful that we can share the stuff that you have um, alongside our other content partners. Um, I got a comment from Trisha um, on Facebook. Um, not anyone can you can write it in your own language if you want to contribute your story. I think the story is for your own community and your own family, so you don't need to translate it for us. We're just trying to make it viewable for you guys, so then you can have memories of it. Um, another one is from Nate. Uh, do you have any direct contacts with the Topolo community to assist with documenting? Um, me and Chrissy, we're hoping to do some events, possibly when our alert levels become a bit more, the clarity around it, um, to get the Topolo community to come and see these items um, and just making a relationship with them to see how we can show the items, but also helping with what needs to be prioritised and which, which items do Tokloans and Tokloan community want to see online as well. So yeah, um, we're going to be organising some events so that the community can come in. Um, we've just been working with the Tokloan community in Wellington at the moment just because of our location, but I'm happy to work with anybody. Um, so if you're interested in connecting with us, just send us an email um, and connect with us via Facebook or or email. Um, I think that's all that. I had one that I'll speak to. Oh, Leonie's come back with one more, and I'll just speak to it so everyone can hear it in the in the panel. So Leonie's asked, um, do user con does the user contribution content become searchable on Digital Pacific? Um, and the the short answer is no. And I had to confirm that myself by quickly googling uh, using the site, not googling Digital Pacificing uh, <laughs> some content. Uh, and what that is, uh, Leonie, is basically the the, the the free text that's in a, a user contribution is not currently searched by Solar, our, our engine. Um, we could add it to that, but we'd have to walk gently into that to make sure that, you know, in terms of users understanding how we would be um, adding their data to the API and to our site. Um, but it would, so there's that to walk gently towards that, but there's also the um, the positive of that is that it adds a whole bunch of uh, essentially crowdsourced information to to our to our database that we could present and show alongside the the metadata and the records from Archives New Zealand and other content partners. Um, so in short, it's not there yet, but we could build that capacity. <laughs> um, Kim, I got another question from Facebook. What happens after the two year digital Pacific funding is exhausted? <laughs> is additional funding being sought to host fleet maintain this resource? <laughs> 
Uh, yes, so currently that's one of my roles to uh, engage and we are engaging uh, with our current funder DFAT uh, and exploring what options are available. Um, I can't say any more than that other than on balance across the board everyone sees it as a very positive project uh, and there's, there is um, uh, a desire to see it continue to operate and, and to be of use to the Pacific. Awesome. All of our questions answered. Yep, cool. So I'll wrap up there. Thank you very much, Tabatu. Uh, and thank you to you, Chrissy, and to Terence, the cameraman, uh, and to all your staff. What I loved about your, one of the things, well, lots of things I enjoyed about this hour, but I enjoyed how as we took you took us through the tour, all of your staff were just heads down working like it wasn't staged at all. They were all in the in, in the zone doing archiving and digitizing. The machine had someone there. <laughs> It was very cool to see. It's very cool to see. So thank you so much for um, uh, opening your doors uh, virtually and, and to us uh, today and to all the people that joined us and to those on Facebook as well. Um, and thank you for sharing those items. Thanks, Tups, for sharing your um, pieces uh, and linking to a number of those um, source ones as well. Um, as Tapatu said, we will. Uh, this will be uh, on Facebook Live on our, on our page, so you can view it there. Um, it will be then edited and posted up on YouTube page for later on. Um, but do reach out to, if you had any questions, do reach out to Archives New Zealand and the work they do, uh, and also to us as well um, via our About page. Um, but yeah, thank you so much everyone to joining us. We will uh, head back to our days. Hope you have a wonderful Tokelau Language Week, uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next Digital Pacific Live. Take care, everyone. Oh, he's done. We'll have a planning session soon. Chrissy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, nice. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Terence. Right, thank you, Terence. Cheers, Chrissy. Take care. Yeah.